I guess every child says that their dad is the best. He was just to me a normal father. He, I didn't know him as a politician, I just knew him as my dad. And he was so gentle with me in particular. Jim was, was many things. He had uh, different uh, talents. Jim was charming. Mutumuzuri sana. Ana cheke shawatu. Tuko tukufanya kazi na wachana wengine wawe na mi watatu. Na tuko tukumgojia sana. We know that your government is committed to bring the African into the field of commerce and business. We have accepted this challenge with your blessing. Kenyatta was very fond of him in the beginning uh, and he spent time in, in the Prime Minister's office. Mimi nafikiri baadala ya kuzungumuza na kiingereza, nita zungumuza na kiswahili, ambacho ndicho luka ya wananchi. Well, I met uh, Jem uh, um, in uh, Nairobi and uh, I was uh, introduced uh, uh, to him by some mutual friends of ours. We looked upon him as a very, very, very knowledgeable person and uh, he had a lot of, uh, you know, admirers. J.M. Karaoke or J.M. was an ambitious young man. His ambition earned him a place on the tip of the most powerful clique around President Jomo Kenyatta. J.M. will however go missing one morning. For 12 days, the state said nothing until his body surfaced up at the city mortuary. In 1975, the independent nation known as Kenya was only 12 years old. The middle class was slowly taking up its place in the urban areas. The white settlers had been reduced to foreigners, but still had clout. The Kenyatta government, on the other hand, was facing a reputation crisis. The regime that came to power on the back of national euphoria was now increasingly being viewed as a Kiambu affair. A powerful clique had now completely surrounded the grand old man, Muse Jomo Kenyatta, and shielded him from the realities of the nation. Young James Mwangi Karaoke OJM, as he was popularly known, also found his place somewhere inside the Kenyatta circles. At the time when we were growing up, we would hear him saying Muse. So I, I didn't know who this Muse was. I just knew Muse has said Muse needs all, you know. And um, one time he came home and he quickly were put into a car and taken to this house which had very tall white walls. I didn't know that was State House. And um, it was a birthday party for one of Mzee's children. And because of hearing Mzee, 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 the presence of Kenyatta when he walked in was so overwhelming. I mean, as a child, I couldn't even look at him. I just felt, I can't look at this Muse. he seems to be so powerful, you know. He had this aura around him and um, it, to me, to be honest, I, I didn't quite know that that was the president of Kenya because I just knew Muse, Muse, Muse. It wasn't until much later on in life that I realized who that was. So I'm imagining the relationship they had was um, good if we could go to State House for a birthday party and vice versa, if they could come to our house. I'm imagining that they had a good relationship. He was always kept at an assistant minister level, but that was consistent with Kenyatta's approach to all the Mau Mau freedom fighters except Paul Nge and Achenga Neka. And Paul Nge then he kept as, as a minister because there was a personal loyalty. And Achenga Neko he, he was, again, it was a personal decision, but soon after 63, by 66, Acheng had resigned and moved to KPU together with Charamuki. So everybody else, Bildad Kagia, one of our most senior film fighters, but only at assistant minister level, Fred Kubai, assistant minister, and none of these people were picked up 
to assume any position where they could exercise real power. That was never done. So JM was kept at that, but he, he was uh, uh, regarded very much as part of, of the, uh, not the Kenyatta circle, but the Kenyatta government. He, he was never an opponent, nothing like that. Twelve years earlier, JM had been appointed as Kenyatta's private secretary, first when Jomo Kenyatta was Kenya's prime minister and later as president, a position he held for straight two years between 1962 and 1964, but JM Karioki was also a marked man. He, as we moved into the late 60s, doubts began to arise in people as to whether the, the government had become a, a personal tool of, of one man, a few people, one few families and so on. By the early 70s, 71, 72, it was clear that Kenyatta has dropped all pretense that this was a national government. Uh, the break with KPU had come, the detentions had come, KPU had been declared uh, deregistered. Uh, so we were a de facto one-party state. The, but more important, uh, we had become a, a, a decision-making process vested in very few about six, seven, eight people, and we had ceased to have a national government. They never made JM a part of that. The ambitious young man from Nyandarwa routinely uttered words that rattled the powerful clique around Muse. When we came up with the National Youth Service Act, it provided for the office of national youth leader who would head the National Youth Service, plus with the directors, of course, of various sections or departments. And Kenyatta appoints J.M. Kariuki, the first director, the, national, the first national youth leader. As a national leader of the National Youth Service, J.M. appealed to the younger generation, a jobless majority in the country at the time. They started a smear campaign, and it started from cabinet ministers. I'm a witness, because I, I was asked by a few of them, because they knew we were, we were friends with JM. They wouldn't approach him to ask him why he was appointed and given that kind of uniform. But they would rather talk to me. They told them, but JM did not appoint himself. One thing he didn't know, he was going to be appointed. And um, the, 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 I think the, the uniform ranked that of a current, of a, of a category of a brigadier in the normal services. So a lot of members of parliament started now murmuring, bickering here and there. How can an MP also wear this kind of uniform be appointed to be head of a security system? In 1968, J.M. Karaoke made what many said was a grave mistake. He entered parliament in full National Youth Service uniform. Only one was brave enough to raise a question with the speaker. Why should a politician come to the house dressed in military uniform? They even didn't know it was going to be referred to as National Youth Service uniform. So to them, the uniform of a disciplined force was a military uniform. And the speaker, half a slate, ruled out that question quickly. I think he sensed what was being asked. Because Jim had come from uh, some field. As a national leader of the youth service and a member of parliament for Nyandaro North, that act was viewed by some as undermining the presidency. Jim would even attend uh, special security meetings. And there are photographs to prove that. Right? There are photographs, very nice photographs, to prove that he was actually involved in some of those security meetings with the other seniors in the military, the police, everywhere. And I'm sure even then, 
in those in those uh, meetings, somebody somewhere must have been asking, why should an MP, a politician, be thrown into our system by Jose? They may not have been comfortable. Either they thought he was Kenyatta's spy, right? Which can also happen. It could have happened. Or there was a mistake in appointing him to these committees. Openly senior politicians closed the present question James' motive. Some accused him of trying to rival the commander-in-chief, President Jomo Kenyatta. A few weeks later, JM was sacked as the national youth leader of the powerful National Youth Service. From uh, youth service to another office and he appointed him assistant minister for agriculture, special duties, in brackets, special duties. You know, special duties also made the same perpetrators of his life now see other things. Why move from youth service, where there was also kind of special duties, to now bring him to agriculture, and <laughs> special duties also. There must be something between J.M. and Mose, which they're not telling us. And, and, and I've never seen a fellow enjoying his work like J.M. because we took up agriculture, as if we had lost nothing in the youth of us. Those in the know say the clique around Kenyatta and perhaps the Mze himself became increasingly uneasy with the attention JM was receiving. One time, JM was given a standing ovation to the amusement of Kenyatta, who had attended a parliamentary session. Kenyatta was there when we were being sworn in. And he sees what when, uh, because when your name is called out, and you are going to swear, members would, uh, uh, would bang the, 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 the seats. And uh, they appreciate you in the way they thought. So when James stood, near, nearly the whole house stood up in ovation. It, it was, it was a, a electric. Then he swore, then he sat down. For a long time he spoke, and the, the, the media gave him coverage. Uh, the following morning, the, pap the papers carried his story, page one, big, bold, with beautiful pictures. And, uh, you know, because whatever he said, he always had uh, prepared in advance uh, what to say, because he just did speak for the sake of speaking. He spoke what he thought or what he knew people wanted to, to, to say. He was speaking on behalf of the people. President Jomo Kenyatta was fond of JM Karaoke. Those close the president, however, felt JM was trying to challenge the imperial presidency and also upstage a well grounded state mafia. Case files takes a short break. On the first day of March 1975, JM's widow Doris Nyambura left Nairobi for their home in Gilgil. JM remained in Nairobi. Later that day, JM was seen at a local casino before leaving in the company of Ben Gethi. Ben Gethi was the commandant of the powerful paramilitary crack unit, the General Service Unit. That was the last time JM was seen or heard from. And we were, we were being told by some messengers 
He knew James since yesterday. Left his car at Hilton, a Mercedes car. And we have been to the, 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 the messages from Hilton are asking where he is. He will, not, he will come in the park, go and uh, have his meals and drink with the friends and then go. But this time, he left that car there. The last person to be seen with outspoken Nyandara member of parliament being the commandant of the dreaded General Service Unit. News of JM Karaoke missing spread far and fast. The country was on the edge, emerging from a political assassination of another powerful figure, cabinet minister Tom Boyer. Unresolved political issue between the loyalist Kenyatta government that had taken over power in Kenya and those who had brought about independence. And Kenyatta was breaking those promises as were others. And so there is the assassination of the general and the refusal to negotiate with those coming out of the forest. He, for example, was the only politician, particularly from the central province, uh, who went to the funeral of the late Tom, Tom Boyer, who had been uh, killed in a similar manner. And uh, because of that, again, he made even more enemies from the same people who didn't like what he was doing, out of in a in a weave. Yeah. Uh, so that is the kind of person we are talking about. Yeah. He did fear. He knew he was the only one, and he had to go all the way to Rusinga Island to the funeral of his colleague. The government was suddenly under pressure from parliament to explain the whereabouts of J.M. Karaoke. The then Vice President Daniel Toroi teacher up Moi told parliament that J.M. Karaoke had traveled to Zambia for official business. Moi doubled up as the Minister for Home Affairs and lead of government business on the floor of parliament. Well, I, I heard that he was missing uh, through our High Commissioner in Nairobi because he knew that I was a friend of, uh, of, of J.M. So, since I was the Minister of Foreign Affairs at that time, he got in touch with my office to notify them that the minister's friend is missing. Uh, he hasn't been seen. And then when the story broke out, I think it was either in the nation or in the standard, not quite sure, one of these two, maybe even in both, that he was visiting Zambia, visiting me in Zambia. Uh, when I had actually seen him off before I left for the Far East, uh, my office then contacted me that he was missing. I was still in New Zealand at the time. And when I got to the Philippines, that is when I heard that now uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was actually uh, uh, still missing and there were reports that uh, he was with me here in, 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 at, uh, in Osaka. Uh, so I, uh, I was a bit agitated by that because I felt that, you know, the, uh, I realized immediately that something sinister must have happened because he had just been to visit Zambia and he had left before I left for the Far East. How come that now they were reporting that, you know, uh, he, he was in Zambia visiting me when he had already left Zambia? Where was J.M. Karaoke? Was J.M. Karaoke missing or had something worse happened to him? There was awkward silence from JM's senior friends, now turned enemies in government. Kenyatta's inner circle included senior superintendent of police, Arthur Wanyuke Thungu, the present personal bodyguard, a shadowy, even sinister figure. Biuko Inange, the Minister of State, never left President Kenyatta's side until his death. Mbiu wielded so much power that those around Jomo Kenyatta Times thought the president had shared with him classified state secrets. Bruce Mackenzie's Kenyatta's agriculture minister had a run-in with the Nyandaro member of parliament, J.M. Karaoke, in the past. Early in 1969, J.M. took advantage of the minister's absence and sacked seven expatriates employed by his boss, Bruce Mackenzie. Mackenzie canceled his trip and flew back home an enraged man. He wrote letters to all the expatriates. He had calculated their salary arrears and what was was due, whatever benefits. I think the PSO was uh, whoever it is had been. He had instructed him to do that job, 
give him a proper exercise. And that's what happened. Sujem sent checks with those letters to each expatriate executive, terminating the, 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 the contract. The cabinet did not disown JM's decision to fire the seven expats. Mackenzie never forgave JM. JM Karaoke's widow says the first person she called was her co wife, Terry Karaoke. <laughs> But JM was not coming back. JM was missing and the country was demanding for answers. This was 10 days after he was reported missing. Ben Gethi, a dreaded figure around Jomo Kenyatta, was the last person to be seen with a Nyanaro member of parliament who had now run into trouble with the Kenyatta administration. Just days before JM went missing, a bomb had gone off at the OTC bus station in downtown Nairobi. 27 people had died. A former permanent secretary in the Kenyatta administration told Case Files, moments after the bomb blast, JM walked to him and told him the blast was meant to divert attention. JM told the permanent secretary, who had hosted him in Karen for an evening cocktail party attended by several senior government officials, that he was the main target. The blast was meant to prepare the country for the worst, JM Karaoke's murder. If these things are planted as we did think they were planted, then why was the government planting them if it was not involved? JM had on the morning of his disappearance gone to the Hilton Hotel in his private vehicle. The member of parliament took up his favorite sport where he was served by a man he knew too well. Those who knew JM Karaoke described him as a fiery politician who rarely took prisoners. JM will at times travel across the country for fundraisers, an undertaking that was in some circle viewed as an exclusive privilege of the present Jomo Kenyatta at the time. JM was one politician who openly spoke about the rising numbers of poor Kenyans openly spoke about the promises the government had made to a younger nation that was now 12 years old, a situation he famously captured as a country of 10 millionaires and 10 million beggars. JM Karaoke's widow told Case Files she was later informed that the body of a man had been booked at the city mortuary. At the time, the government had insisted several times that JM had traveled to Zambia for an official visit when Vice President Daniel Moy, who was in charge of the police and home affairs docket, stood up to speak, he was cut short by screaming women. JM Karaoke's widows had managed to sneak into parliament and were shouting from the public gallery. When he comes and reads that, or states that, JM's wife scream in the balcony. You see, his body is in the city mucha. Don't tell Kenya lies. Moy was so affected. I saw him when I was in the house. He couldn't speak anymore. The only bastard in me said, if that be true, then this country is in danger. James' body had been discovered in a thicket in the outskirts of Gong Town. The country was caught up between fear and death. Josiah Mwangi Karaoke was a dead man. His daughters, hundreds of kilometers away in a missionary school in Kitale. I remember one of them as soon as they got into the car, that is Rosemary. And she said, it is Kissinger, isn't it? And then she said, well, they found him, but unfortunately he's dead. Just like that. I cannot tell you for the next few minutes exactly what happened, but I remember crying. The journey of a man who, at only 46 years old, had had an illustrious political career, had come to an abrupt and tragic end. 
what followed was a garment racing against time, time to cover up a murder that had been orchestrated from within and executed under the watch of senior officials. Josiah Mwangi Karaoke was dead. His body lay at the city mortuary, but his story had just started to unravel. For 12 days, Josiah Mwangi Karaoke was a missing man. The nation failed to capture the mood of a government that was out to eliminate dissenting voices. Eazalia, another prominent politician, Tom Boyer, had been assassinated. Case Files continues next week. When will these incumbents uh, fading rain end? We went to James house and he went to the bedroom and said, oh, so they coming to find out whether you are safe and coming home, blah, blah, blah. Kenyatta was a smart player at putting on uh, different faces to different uh, audiences. The DO, the chiefs, those people who didn't uh, like him for no, for no reason at all, just because they were working for a particular group or a particular uh, clique. He told them no. I am not going to run away because if I do, they are going to kill me out there and you people will be told that I was uh, hanging around with somebody's wife and the fellow just shot me. And, and, and that, is, that will not be true. I, I, I will die here. He was determined to die here. He knew they were after him. He used to say, in Kikuyu, Muzai cannot kill me, yeah. He used to tell my mom, other people will kill me but not Muzai. A decision to eliminate Josiah Mwangi Karaoke was arrived at in Nakuru, the very town Josiah Mwangi Karaoke grew up in. His killers identified a location an opportune time and even a van to ferry his remains to Ngong Hills. Tonight on Case Files, JM is dead. Starts now. Lying on a cold slab in a corner of the city mortuary was the body of Josiah Mwangi Karaoke or JM as he was popularly known. It was the second high-profile murder and assassination in the country. JM's body had been booked at the mortuary by unknown people on the morning of the second day of March, 1975. His disappearance and murder caught a young nation 12 years into self-rule by surprise. Doubts began to arise in people as to whether the, the government had become a, a personal tool of, of one man, a few people, one few families and so on. By the early 70s, 71, 72, it was clear that Kenyatta has dropped all pretense that this was a national government uh, the break with KPU had come, the detentions had come, KPU had been declared uh, deregistered. Uh, so we were a de facto one-party state. The 
But more important, uh, we have become a, a, a decision-making process vested in very few, about six, seven, eight people. And we had ceased to have a national government. They never made JM a part of that. The Kenyatta administration had a mud on its hands. The family of the slain outspoken Yandara member of parliament was at a loss. Rosemary Karioki, a young girl at the time, says she was in school hundreds of kilometers away when she received the news about her father. The nun called me that morning, early in the morning, just after breakfast, and she said, um, remember they said your dad is missing? And I said, yes. And then she said, well, they found him, but unfortunately he's dead, just like that. I cannot tell you for the next few minutes exactly what happened but I remember crying you know um, and I actually ran towards her and you know she was consoling me and I don't know for how long I cried but I feel like I cried for a very long time then she said um, now you have to dry your tears because we have to tell your sister and that's when I reality check you know wow this thing has happened it's gonna affect so many people in the family Rosemary Karioki's uncle told Case Files he was in college when he heard of JM's murder. I got to the house about uh, 11, 10, 11. And uh, there were already very many people. Uh, a lot of people still wailing. Others say hello and uh, they don't even want to answer, but the mood was. was uh, very, very, very sad. Shocked by the sudden twist of events, Kanye says he drove to Kitale to pick up James' daughter Rosemary Karioki and her small sister. Uh, the, the, I had not expected the children to be aware of the goings on. But I remember one of them as soon as they got into the car, that is Rosemary, and she said, it is Kissinger, isn't it? And, and I was surprised because I didn't, I didn't, I was, I, I was still wondering how I'm going to explain. It was Kissinger, right? Because I just now understood he has died and then he said, yeah, you're right. You see, in our house, we had this name for people who didn't like my dad and somehow it was always Kissinger, but I never asked who was Kissinger and why, but um, he just said yes. Mbiuko Inange, a man with an arresting strong presence, was the Minister of State in President Jomo Kenyatta's administration. Koinange never left Kenyatta's side until his death. Those who knew Koinange say he was one of the closest government officials around Jomo Kenyatta. Rosemary says as they drove back to Nairobi, their eyes soaked in tears, afraid of an unusual about the status of other family members. The cool from their small car see people milling around newspaper stands. The journey from Eldoret to Nairobi was a bit vague, but I remember every time we would stop to put fuel, there was people huddling together and reading, the, I think it was a paper or something. There was this, some eerie feeling in every place that we stopped. JM's close friend Mark Muidaga, at the time a member of parliament of Nakuru constituency says, members of parliament drove the city mortuary to witness firsthand the gruesome murder of their colleague. When we reached there, you know, it, it, it became also very disturbing to find the chief security officer of parliament buildings, Samuel Koth, was now here with a new label of mortuary attendant. It was intact, it was his body, except then the teeth, which had been removed here, and the label on one leg, a body, an unclaimed body of a Luo gangster. That was the label tied to his leg. An unclaimed body of a Luo gangster. Young Rosemary, straight from school, tired and terrified, arrived in the company of his mother and her siblings to view the body of a man they had called father, a man they had grown to admire. 
So we go to the mortuary and nobody's telling us that we're going to the morgue. Nobody has said anything. So we get in and there's this table with a box and um, people are walking around and out. So I did not realize until I got very close that we were just about to see my dad. And uh, I realized then that it was him because of the hands. I was tall enough to see the hands. And um, when I got to the face, I was so shocked because it didn't look like him. But the explanation for that was maybe that's how people look when they die. You know, I was a child, I didn't know. And um, I remember saying, it, that doesn't look like him. The hands, to me, that was him, but the face, it wasn't him. The wife says the husband looked different. The man she married was the man now lay dead on a cold slab in the mortuary. Hey, I didn't JM Karioki's other wife Terry Karioki told the media that when they rushed the city mortuary in the company of members of parliament, staff at the morgue were trying to push through the window the lifeless body of the slain member parliament. The family had discovered the body at the morgue, but minutes later the story will have changed if the staff at the morgue, with the help of faceless individuals, had managed to take away JM Karioki's body. It will have been a case of a missing person, not a dead one. And, and the body was there now, lying on the stretchers, without shoes, socks, yes. His socks were still on, intact. Is uh, the, the, the race course kind of kauta, kaunda suit, and the white and red spotted uh, scarf also uh, was there. Unknown to many, JM's body had been discovered at the base of Gong Hills by herdsmen and later booked at the city mortuary. Sensing a growing public anger, the government swiftly moved in and deployed hands of policemen at the slain member parliament's home along Gong Road. It was clear that the Kenyatta administration was anticipating trouble from a population that had witnessed a third political assassination in under 10 years. Pio Gama Pinto was a dead man, so was Tom Boyer. They had not touched GM. Because, as I said, they misread him. They thought he, would, he, he was part of them. And this camouflage comes about because, for example, JM was never part of the back benches, which Kagia and Pinto were, Burudi, Nabuera, and all these people. He was not part of that. He, he spoke independently, but he was never part of that. He never joined Odinga in resigning. He did not become a member of KPU. He did not leave Kanu. And all these things puzzled them for a while, but he never forgot what his ideals were and never gave them up. There was little official communication from the government over the missing and subsequent murder of the flamboyant Yandaro North Member Parliament. The government had informed the country through Parliament that JM was safe and sound and had traveled to Zambia for an official government trip. You see, Moy was then Home Minister, and he was the one, interior and so on, and he was the one who had to say that JM had gone to Zambia. And when it all blew up, he came into the house, and you should find it in Hansard, he, he stammered that he didn't know that this was not true. So they had misled him as well, a and he was not a part of and he never, he never uh, attempted to stop the committee from functioning and so on. The pin drop silence from the government and attention focused on the OTC bombing gave the government a chance to look the other way. For 12 days, Yusama Mwangi Karioki's body lay somewhere at the city mortuary. Case Files takes a short break.
You see, Moy was then Home Minister, and he was the one, Interior and so on, and he was the one who had to say that JM had gone to Zambia. And when it all blew up, he came into the house, and you should find it in Hansard. He he stammered that he didn't know that this was not true. It is Kissinger, isn't it? And, and I was surprised because I didn't, I didn't, I was, I, I was still wondering how I'm going to explain. It was Kissinger, right? Because I just now understood he has died, and then he said, "Yeah, you're right." It became also very disturbing to find the chief security officer of Parliament buildings, Samuel Koth was now here with a new label of mortuary attendant. Five days after James murder, President Jomo Kenyatta, while on a tour of the Rift Valley, made remarks that left many guessing. The telling remarks appear to have been sending a coded message. Kenyatta spoke about Lucifer, the fallen angel. Jomo Kenyatta, narrated to a crowd of dancers the biblical story of the angel who he described as the favorite archangel of the king. The angel, however, became a devil when he revolted and started demanding for too much and stepping on everyone's toes. Kenyatta told the crowd the devil was hurled from heaven for his wickedness and revolt against God. Kenyatta's biblical story was capped with the warning that the government will have no mercy on any individual out to disrupt peace and harmony. It wasn't until five days later after Kenyatta's remarks that the body of JM Karaoke surfaced at the city mortuary with five bullet holes. Kenyatta told the country JM's murder was the most cruel and appealed for calm. Operating under fear suppressed by heavy police presence, in late March 1975, the family of J.M. Karaoke ferried his remains for burial. I remember as we were driving, there was people who had lined up on the road. And when we would pass, they would just break down, some would faint. And it was so confusing for me because I was wondering, how did, when did they get to know my dad, you know? I was really wondering what's going on. And these people were people just lining up and I was thinking, was it for us? You know, I was really wondering. Thousands of mourners turned up for the politically charged burial of the slain member of parliament. University students were chanting anti-Kenyatta slogans. There was more to come. Um, I remember Moi Kibaki and that statement that he made that even it, if it takes a hundred years, we want to know who and why was JM killed. Apart from Simeon Nyachai, none of JM Karaoke's friends in the government now turned enemies showed up to send him off. When he stood up to speak, everybody shouted him. Everybody said, no, we don't want that. The university students, they were like, no, we don't want messages from murderers. And, you know, I was very shocked. It was my first time to witness open rebellion against a head of state. And um, I didn't know how that was going to add to value to us or make it worse for us, I didn't know. And um, so the message was never read. And uh, Nechai went on to say other things. He didn't convey the message of condolence. The only government officer who had been sent by the government to represent the government uh, was the then uh, provincial commissioner for central province. Uh, no, it could be Rift Valley. Uh, he was booed when he tried to read uh, Kenyatta's uh, uh, speech and he had to stop. Uh, but he, he was a good friend of the family. He was, he was not uh, harassed or anything, but we, we could not accept anything like that. It, it, it had uh, gone on for so long. The government was uh, trying to eliminate JM in very many ways. They tried to silence him politically, they were not able. They tried to get him either to run away or uh, link him with some funny issues and they were not able. So it was very clear, JM knew they were going to kill him. And in fact, according to some people, they, he, he, he told them, no, 
I am not going to run away because if I do, they are going to kill me out there and you people will be told that I was uh, hanging around with somebody's wife and the fellow just shot me. And, and, and that, is, that will not be true. I, I will die here. He was determined to die here. He knew they were after him. What we don't know is the particular person who pulled the trigger. But we know the government did it. And the whole world knows that. JM's short but illustrious career came to an abrupt end. Nobody, nobody saw him as the politician of only one people. No, no. He was a national figure. They, they, they couldn't handle him with detention. They couldn't handle him within the constituency. They couldn't impoverish him. He had his wealth which was independent of them. They felt in the end that he was a threat to the central position that Kenyatta had manufactured as Kenya's sole hero of independence, as Kenya's sole political determinant. And here was a person younger, uh, more charismatic now than Kenyatta had, was in his old age. And he was a threat to the old man's standing. He was a threat to the family, to the, the preeminence of the family. President Jomo Kenyatta, who had in the previous years never hidden his liking and fondness of JM, did not attend his funeral. Apart from asking the public to volunteer any information about the member of parliament's death, Kenyatta said little about a man who worked for him as his private secretary, a national youth leader, and his assistant minister for agriculture. When JM died, the, the mood was and instantly became an unspoken rejection of, of Kenyatta personally and of his of his style of government totally. People went about their business but everybody's face if, if the subject not only of JM's passing but also of the cover-up was, was a pushback of all that Kenyatta stood for. On the 21st of March 1975, Kenyatta drove home his earlier warning on those how to destabilize his government. Kenyatta staged a military parade at high noon from the Kenya cinema in the central business district. Kenyatta was adorned in military gear and accompanied by his generals and then Vice President Daniel Moy. I would say it was an active rejection and that is why he he had that parade to show i'm still i can still muster this and, and don't try anything it was, uh... six days later kenyatta left nairobi for mombasa for the easter holidays those who sanctioned JM Karaoke's assassination tried every trick in the book to cover up his murder. A parliamentary select committee was set up by parliament, but President Jomo Kenyatta kept an eye on it. Case files, JM Investigations continues next week. meat bank van. This is the van they used to take the body to. We take him to go. It was horrible.
They tried to silence him politically. They were not able. They tried to get him either to run away or uh, link him with some funny issues, and they were not able. So it was very clear, JM knew they were going to kill him. It was clear from the onset that the Jomo Kenyatta administration was not keen on investigating the assassination of Josiah Mwangi Karioki. It took a parliamentary select committee to probe his murder. But even here, the Jomo Kenyatta administration was at the center of things. Tonight on Case Files, the JM cover up starts now. From the onset, the Jomo Kenyatta administration had denied knowledge of the whereabouts of the Nyandarua North Member of Parliament, Josiah Mwangi Karioki, until his body was discovered at the city mortuary by his two widows, Terry Karioki and Doris Nyambura. The family of the slain politician had an idea of who might have been behind the murder of their own, but had no way of proving it. The family's odds were stuck against a regime that had constantly become insensitive to criticism, a regime of a few political players out to amass wealth and influence. Before his body was discovered, the government sent coded and consuming narratives to the media about the whereabouts and status of the young outspoken politician. The government claimed with so much authority that the member of parliament had traveled on an official trip to Zambia, but JM was already dead. His body lay in a mortuary in the city. For a straight 11 days, the security system that was heavily involved in JM's murder put up a brave face while an anxious nation waited on the very security apparatus to trace Josiah Mwangi Karioki's movements and whereabouts. On the 12th day of March 1975, a police officer drove to JM's karaoke's house off Ngong Road and informed his two widows that a body had been booked at the city mortuary. Well, the constable we interviewed actually, we got him. And he confessed that he, he was an admirer, he was an admirer of JM. He started admiring him in Moranga when JM went to address meetings or gatherings there. Is the one who went to go James' home, Rose Avenue, and told the, the women if he found there's a body which was removed to set a mortuary. We don't know whose it is, what have you. If you're looking for the body of your husband, why don't you also find out about that body? He didn't tell them he knew it was Jay. The police officer wanted the family to go and check out if it was that of the slain politician. Sasa tukatoka. Ndio tukaenda parliament. Kusema tumeona Jay yemu iko iko mochadi. Wakasema kweli eh. Tukaenda tukatoka na wao. Hata hata zoezi kubuka tulibebwa ni gani? Ngali gani ama tulienda na muna gani? Zoezi kubuka lakini tulienda na wote. What? Wabuge. Sasa tulipoenda wakasema wakasema kwanza wakasema jeye mapana iko huko. Awaibuka sikasema tufugweni tumtafuta iko hapa. There are those people who write answers to questions in parliament what have you. And that's their work in the offices. So Moy was given and the, as, he, as a vice president and minister his work is not to investigate. It's come and report what officers have found out. And that's when he comes and reads parliament. When he comes and reads that, or states that, James' wife scream in the balcony. You see, his body is in the city mortuary. Don't tell Kenya lies. Moy was so affected. I saw him, I was in the house. 
He couldn't speak anymore. The only last time he said, if that be true, then this country is in danger. Two days after the discovery of his body, Parliament passed a resolution that will see the government fight back and fight viciously. A parliamentary select committee was set to investigate the murder of a flamboyant member of parliament. Mark Muidaga was a member of the committee. Normally the government of Kenyatta and later Moy used to take the initiative to set up a committee which would be made up of stooges and functionaries who, who would go through the motions. This committee looking into JM's assassination was formed by the house itself. In, it is a tribute to the regard in which he was held. Again, it underlines why the, the, Kenyatta, the Kenyatta circle was afraid of this man, because he had the support of people from all over Kenya. That was reflected in the way the committee was set up. And it was reflected in who was on the committee. But the committee was relying on the political goodwill of the Kenyatta administration that many believed was involved in the brutal murder of the legislator. Police Hinga, Ben Hinga, late Ben Hinga, he called Hinga, he brought the special branch headed by Kanyotu and Moridi. We called all of them. Anyway, we called everybody we thought had a possibility of either a message, information, a hearsay, a, an imagination, whatever we thought you can bring to this committee, we would call you to try and get it out of you. Unknown to the political class, the National Security Intelligence Service, NSIS, had fed some of the committee members with precise information on how the murder of the minister had been carried out. The NSIS had warned the Kenyatta administration against carrying out the murder. It never listened. Someone in Kenyatta Zina Sako Mbio Koinange, the Minister of the State, Wanyoike Thungu, Jomo Kenyatta's bodyguard, the man in charge of the General Service Unit, Ben Gethi, and the Criminal Investigations Department Director Ignatius Nderi, became a toll order. Indeed, Remarks by the aging president Jomo Kenyatta a few days after JM Karaoke had been murdered, that Lucifer had been defeated, were taken to imply that Lucifer was JM Karaoke who had fallen out with Kenyatta. Those remarks set the tone of the entire parliamentary select committee investigating the MP's murder. The committee presented a perfect murder stage where several witnesses painted a picture of a group of individuals who acted with impunity in carrying out the former assistant minister's murder and another group that walked around the clock to cover it up. Two police inspectors told the probe committee that they had received a report of a man found shot dead on the foot of Ngong Hills, but it wasn't until late in the afternoon that they dispatched a vehicle to pick up the body. Instead of the officers ferrying the body to the city mortuary, they let it lie in a police land rover for the better part of the afternoon of the 3rd of March 1975 before finally a dusk decided to deliver it to the mortuary. The body was lying at a police station. Police officers in Gong, despite family members reporting to the police about their missing kin, never cared to tell the public that indeed the body they had ferried to the city mortuary was that of JM Karaoke. They said nothing for 11 days. Police officers also lied that they had taken the fingerprints of the body to ascertain its identity. They only did it when JM Karaoke's widow stormed the city mortuary and later informed parliament they had seen JM's body in the mortuary. The committee was told there were plans to present JM Karaoke as a gangster from the Luo community who had a tag to that effect placed on his body. We claimed body of a Luo gangster. Can you imagine that fellow who did that was not even intelligent. How can you call it an unclaimed body as if bodies of Luo's are ever always claimed and of a Luo gangster? You can imagine a Luo gangster where in Nairobi or where. With numerous dead bodies from a blast in a bus a day earlier, 
it was possible JM would have been buried as an identified person. It's almost as if the, the dirty tricks are simply fished out from an old box and they say, we bomb it ambassador and so they go and do the same thing, etc. So we, we can see these patterns and these, if these things are planted as we did think they were planted, then why was the government planting them if it was not involved? The Parliamentary Select Committee on the Disappearance and Subsequent Murder of JM placed several people at the scene of the MP's murder. The team constructed the last moment of the member parliament, linked several senior officials and even went further to assign each of them a role they played in executing their murder plot. Kenyatta was a smart player at putting on uh, different faces to different audiences. So the, every Kenyatta day, 20th October, he pulled out his leather jacket and he became a freedom fighter. And the next day he was back there pushing the loyalists case forward and suppressing the persons whom he was glorifying on 20th October. So all these contradictions had become too open. The Parliamentary Select Committee was allowed to run its cause, but key figures fingered by the Select Committee did not show up. Some even threatened to shoot committee members. Case Files takes a short break. The committee placed Ben Gethi, the GSU commandant, as among the group of people interrogated JM Karaoke at the Kingsway House that housed the National Security Intelligence Service headquarters, NSIS. It was true they were with him in the casino the previous night. And he, 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 he was taking some drinks himself, but JM was taking just a concoction of a, a, a beer and sodas or whatever it was. Then, Jamie left and said he was going home. What was surprising is to hear Ben Gethi going to James' house at six in the morning to find out whether he had reached home, which means Ben had some information. He was a combatant of GSU then. We must have had some information. After several months, the committee concluded that JM was shot in the hand by Ben Gethi, the General Service Unit Commandant. Yes, Ben Gethi and, uh, and, uh, and Derry, Ignatius Derry, were the two fellows who got him out of Hilton. Um, and uh, Patrick Shaw was around. And they called him out. But he was equally intelligent. He talked to a young fellow from Okambani, who was uh, one of the, I think, either cashier. Yeah, he was a cashier. He issued him with a check and wrote some message on the back. He wrote the names of the people who he was going with on the check. So whoever saw him write the check thought he was making some payment. But he had recorded the names. Ben Gethi and Ignatius Derry. I was thinking that the fact that JM was with Ben Gethi, and that the fact that I was with JM, and I was with the report of Krimani, was with JSO. I was with JSO, and I was with JSO. Ben 
Who sent these two gentlemen? Because they were for many years friendly to JM. Who sent them and why? Why particularly these two fellows? Why would they not send somebody else? Why would they send him, his friends? It is because they were to be, go, to be used to execute a trap without being suspected. People will not be, uh, he will not fear. People will not be worried to be with. The committee was also told that JM was ferried in a meat van before he was finally bumped off with five bullets at the foot of Ngong Hills. When Ignatius Nderi, the director of criminal investigations department, appeared before the committee, he told the team he was unable to allow the committee to peruse the police investigation file of JM Karaoke. Nderi told the committee he had no permission from his boss, the police commissioner, Bernard Hinga. When Hinga appeared before the committee, he promised to let the team have a look at the files, but it was just that, a promise. We were also brought the information that the GSU car stopped uh, uh, at a roundabout near, uh, as you're going to be intercontinental. And at that point, he was removed from the GSU Mercedes into another car, almost by force. Somebody spotted it, a European. Then this, the story now ended there because nobody saw what happened thereafter. Bioko Inange, a key figure in the Kenyatta regime, and one who was mentioned as central in the mud of JM Karaoke, declined to appear before the committee. Such was impunity that the deputy director of the National Youth Service, Warui Tote, or General China, threatened to shoot anyone who dared to summon him to appear before the Elijah Mwangale Select Committee. Warui Tote, or General China, was placed at the scene of JM's murder. The general was a smoke of the sportsman brand of cigarettes, and used packets of the cigarettes were found at the scene of the MP's murder, added to the suspicion. Somebody must have had a second thought. If we just dumped the body here, this fellow will look up in the morning because of cold. So the mission is to break up this spinal cord. So that's the last bullet, it was here. We, sh we saw it, we asked the CID officers, we asked everybody involved in, in, the, in the ballistics, and they said, yes, this must have been the finishing bullet. A JM Karaoke's watch was also found inside a packet of sportsman cigarettes at a police station in Makongeni. It was clear those who killed JM were the agents of the state. The committee completed its sitting on the 3rd of June 1975, three months after JM Karaoke had been found murdered. The committee was now set to table its report in Parliament when the unexpected happened. The clerk of the National Assembly called the committee chairman, Elijah Mwangale. The clerk told Mwangale that it was urgently needed at State House. President Jomo Kenyatta had been informed that the select committee was set to table before Parliament J.M. Karaoke's murder findings. In State House, with a few committee members of the parliamentary select team, the chairman Elijah Mwangale, Stare member of Parliament Charles Rubia, and former Lurambi member of Parliament Bruni Nabuera, met President Jomo Kenyatta. On his side was the Minister for State, Biuko Inange.
Kenyara did not mince his words. The president wanted to know why the names of his bodyguards Arthur Wanyueke Wathungu and that of his minister Mbio Koinange were contained in the report. Charles Rubia was the first one to inform the president they were ready to have the names expunged from the report immediately. Kenyatta told them by naming Bioko Inange and his bodyguard Wanyoike Wathungu, the team had in fact directly linked him to the murder of JM Karaoke. The president then passed the chairman a green pen and instructed him to remove the names of his senior officials and sign against it. Elijah Mwangali did exactly that, forever making it impossible for JM's killers to stand trial for the murder of the member of parliament. Back in parliament, the session had already started. The select committee sensing that there could be state interference had made several copies of the report and handed a copy to the clerk of the National Assembly. But it was too late. The Elijah Mwangale team arrived in parliament with the report amid wild cheers and foot thumping. Mwangale tabled the report before parliament but minus the two names, President Jomo Kenyatta had defeated justice. The report was not doctored, and I'm saying it was not doctored because the verbatim report is intact. It is in Parliament. It is official. It's illegally there. Why illegally there? Because it was a verbatim report of proceedings of a select committee of Parliament under powers and privileges act. For several months that followed, President Jomo Kenyatta held a series of meetings across the country where he warned those how to destabilize his government. Ministers and members of parliament who accompanied the president pledged their loyalty to him and denounced traitors. President Jomo Kenyatta's men had defeated the course of justice. It wasn't until 25 years later, in the year 2000, when exactly what transpired in State House became clear when the faces of those who killed J.M. Karaoke were revealed. He was not a good politician, because I think a politician should know when to say some things and when he can get results. I think J.M. was just a, a natural leader. He had a vision for Kenya, and he saw nothing else he didn't see that uh, waiting another two years would, would probably change things. But I think he was bitter also because he suffered greatly during the uh, fight for independence when he was detained. So uh, a good politician would probably have survived, but, but not, him. not him. It is always Tyranny is very unoriginal. They use all these formulas and, and re repeat them and repeat them. So why do you do this? Unless you saw that him, his, whether he was alive or his death, was a real challenge to them. And by then, Kenyatta was getting frailer and frailer. But the government, quote unquote, the, the inner decision makers are there behind him saying, no, you must do this, you must, there must be a show of force, blah, blah, blah. Next week on Case Files, we tell you the killers of Josiah Mwangi Karaoke. This as the family waits for justice decades later. Case Files, JM Killers, concludes next Sunday.
he, he treated each one of us in such a special way that we felt we're the best. Truly good politicians who are concerned about change was that he liked people and people liked him very visibly. He had been released in a magistrate's house, private house, and there he was. Thrilling James movement. For 25 years until the year 2000, the story of J.M. Karaoke was a case of political assassination whose perpetrators had remained shadowy characters. To understand why Josiah Mwangi Karaoke or J.M. had to die, one must understand the power struggles around the aging first Kenyan president, Mzee Jomo Kenyatta, at the time, by 1975. A team of powerful political figures had dreamed of the presidency. Tonight on Case Files, we reveal the identity of the killers of Josiah Mwangi Karaoke, men who once called him confident and friend turned cold blood murderers. Tonight on Case Files, JM's Killers concludes. For the first time on Kenyan television, Case Files walks you through the bad blood between President Jomo Kenyatta's bodyguard, Arthur Wanyuike or Wanyuike Wathungu, and JM Karaoke, and the role of the clique of senior politicians who wanted JM dead at all costs. The bitter exchange between Wanyuike Wathungu, a treasurer of the Mau Mau movement, and JM over former Mau Mau fighters he had wanted enlisted as Mze Jomo Kenyatta's bodyguards mark the start of bad blood between JM and his enemies. There were several actors involved in the murder of Josiah Mwangi Karaoke. Many of the actors were the center of the Kenyatta regime that had amassed wealth and power. Case files pieces together the complex murder of a sitting member of parliament, a man who fell out with the powers that be. The history of the one man, one party rule created politicians who were dependent purely on patronage. And every independent politician, Koiki, Orengo, they were punished, Raila. And these people were not able to, to punish JM early. There, there was nothing he gave them on which to, to move against him. He never spoke against the, uh, the government or the president uh, through up to 70 and up to the early 70s. The killing of Josiah Mwangi Karaoke started weeks, even months, before he eventually met his death in the hands of the people he had come to treat as enemies, but who were once his friends. Weeks before his death, J.M. Karaoke was being trailed by a white motor vehicle that will at times be stationed outside his house. The vehicle will openly and intentionally trail the member of parliament to the Hilton Hotel, where he frequented most. At the time, the occupants of the white vehicle were not known until the 28th of February 1975, when he gave out his car to a friend. After a week or so, he raised another issue that his car was being trailed by Patrick Shaw. Again, as before, that matter was laid to rest. Patrick Shaw was a senior superintendent of police attached to the Kenya, Reserve, Kenya Police Reserve. And he'd been there for a long time, operating in Nairobi. 
Patrick was a huge fellow. He must have been about 300 kilos. Shaw was a dreaded crime buster in the country at the time. That was six days before JM went missing. Two days before his murder, JM Karaoke had made plans to travel to Mombasa with a friend. JM was to use public transport. I can remember JM was very agitated. He had come uh, at the casual in here and we were playing that. But somebody talked to him and I don't know why the, the conversation started. And he told him, do you know why I'm angry? I don't hate Kenyatta. I don't hate anybody. But now we all started listening. But look here, you all know about the game of football. Yes. Here, we played a game of football as one team. And in this team, our side won. And our captain went to receive the trophy. And as soon as he received it, and he was gesturing, as soon as he received it, he turned back and went to celebrate with the losing team. That would make anybody angry. I'm not angry with the person, I'm angry with the action. On 1st March 1975, a bomb went off inside an OTC bus in Nairobi's Central Business District. 27 people died. The plan to out Josiah Mwangi karaoke did not work. When JM decided to uh, suspend it, because of this other program of the wedding of uh, the family, the Kisi family, who were very close to him, Jim forgot to tell the girl, the secretary, to cancel it or replan it. So as a result, the seats remained booked, and guys who were studying this, his movements knew for sure he was going. It was a very good mistake, but very bad for, for Kenya citizens because they lost their lives for no apparent reason. His killer changed and waited. The following morning, Ben Gethy, the commandant of the dreaded General Service Unit, was at JM Karaoke's house in Gong. Ben Gethy had the previous night been with JM at a city casino. <laughs> lakini yule mtu alikuja kuniambia hapa kuniangalia ni Ben Gizi. Sasa nikamuliza Ben Gizi na mtu wa serikali na unajua habari ya hao watu wa serikali anakuja na namna gani kwetu na anaingia bedroom. Akaniambia ni kwa sababu jana alinyona nikiwa mgojwa. Ben Gethy's presence in JM's house was to play a specific role. Mark Twist had been imprisoned and it was in the papers well published that he has been sent to jail for two years. But on Sunday, he was spotted at the gong races with his goggles and very smartly dressed. He had been released in a magistrate's house, private house. And there he was. James movement. Mark Twist was a known criminal turned police informer. Several days before JM went missing, Mark Twist was seen near the Nyandara North Member Parliament. It was a Sunday. And Mark Twist, our story was, was using telephone booths. And he communicated effectively with the late uh, Ignatius Deddy, the director of CID. Deddy was a member of the so-called Kiambu Mafia. When the plan to have JM implicated in a series of bombings failed, those how to kill him devised a new strategy. JM had to die on that very day. Those who knew JM Karaoke say the Nyandaro North Member of Parliament was too ambitious. At times, he was too trusting. His approach on issues affecting a young nation at the time got many worried. Case Files takes a short break.
At about midday, Josiah Mwangi karaoke dropped the Hilton Hotel, his popular joint, in tow was Ben Gethi, Patrick Shaw, and Ignatius Nderi. Who sent these two gentlemen? Because they were for many years friendly to JM. Who sent them and why? Why is it particularly these two fellows? Why would they not send somebody else? Why would they send him, his friends? It is because what we go to be used to execute a trap. Jem will later leave the hotel for Gong race course. Again, Ben Gethi also showed up at the races. JM will leave Gong race course later that afternoon for the Hilton. Ben Gethi was yet again spotted outside the Hilton. JM took up his usual spot in the bar area of the Hilton Hotel. Outside the hotel was Patrick Shaw, the police reservist, a European lady policewoman, and Ignatius Nderi, the CID director. As JM had a drink with a friend, JM informed the friend that he was expecting the General Service Unit Commandant, Ben Gethi. JM told the friend that Gethi had telephoned him earlier in the day to inform him that he wanted to see him that very night. Case files for the first time traces JM's last movements while in the hands of his killers. Moments later, Ben Gethi arrived briefly sat with JM and the two left together, but before leaving, JM left behind a note that will later determine who his killers were. But he was equally intelligent. He talked to a young fellow from Ukambani, who was uh, one of the, I think, either cashier. Yeah, he was a cashier. He issued him with a check and he wrote some message on the back. He wrote the names of the people who he was going with on the check. So who's, whoever saw him write the check thought he was making some payment. But he had recorded the names. Ben Gethian, Ignatius Derry. That was the last time Josiah Mwangi Karaoke was seen alive. The next time he was seen, was when his body surfaced up at the city mortuary. Josiah Mwangi Karaoke was walked out of the Hilton Hotel and driven in a motor vehicle. On board the vehicle was police reservist Patrick Shaw and the GSU commandant Ben Gethi. The GSU car stopped uh, um, at a roundabout near, uh, as you're going to Intercontinental. And at that point, he was removed from the GSU Mercedes into another car, almost by force. Somebody spotted it, a European. Josiah Mwangi Karaoke was later driven to the Kingsway House that housed the Special Branch Unit, now the National Intelligence Service. JM met a man he had had a run in years back, Arthur Wanyoke Thungu, or Wanyoke Wathungu, as he was popularly referred to. JM was taken through a series of questions by Jomo Kenyatta's personal bodyguard. An agitated JM denied any involvement in the series of bombings that had rocked the country a few days before. The security team interrogating JM accused him of hiding foreign funds allocated to the National Youth Service. It was in the middle of the bitter exchange between Wanyoike Wathungu and JM Karaoke that Ben Gethi, also a member, of the interrogation team drew his gun and shot JM in the hand. A decision was made to do away with JM karaoke. Later that night, JM was handcuffed, ferried to Loangong area where he was shot five times. His killers left his body in the wild. It wasn't until the following day that two residents of Oloishobori discovered the body of the slain member of parliament. On the Monday, 3rd March 1975, two Maasai herdsmen discovered the body of the slain member of parliament. They reported the murder at Ngong police station. The two Maasai herdsmen informed the police of a body in the thicket about 2 p.m. that Monday afternoon, but it wasn't until 4 p.m. that police finally decided to go and pick the slain MP's remains. The body lay in a police Land Rover 
for another two hours before finally the police decided to have it ferried to the city mortuary. The body was booked as having been delivered to the mortuary at 5.20 p.m. that evening. For 11 days as the country demanded for the whereabouts of Josiah Mwangi Karioki, Ben Gethi, the General Service Unit Commandant, the Director of Criminal Investigations Ignatia Zinderi and President Jomo Kenyatta's personal bodyguards Wanyoke Thungu and the President Mzee Jomo Kenyatta knew that JM Karioki was a dead man. During those 11 days there were attempts to take away the member of parliament's body from the city mortuary. Investigations into the gruesome murder revealed that JM's killers had tried every trick in the book to have his murder covered up. At one point, they even released a convicted criminal from prison, Peter Kinyanjui alias Mark Twist, to help them implicate JM Karaoke in a series of bombings that had hit the country in the second month of 1975. That's not a story because it's uh, recorded verbatim in the parliamentary report. Because we eventually interviewed this Mark Twist. We got him. And we wanted to confirm that whether that is exactly what he was doing. It was tricky and uh, elusive. We didn't answer all the questions we really wanted. But we got what we wanted. Personally, I knew him much earlier because he would follow JM in Akuru. Much earlier. The investigations around JM's murder were comical, at times bordering on the bizarre. For instance, a team of police investigators detailed to investigate the murder of the member of parliament were reporting to the very man who fired the first shot, Ignatius Nderi. The police reservist, Patrick Shaw, who was among the group of people who lured JM from his Hilton Hotel to his death in Gong Hills, was among the people involved in his investigations. After the committee's report, the first thing was to follow up the persons who the committee had said ought to be investigated. These were the police commissioner, these were persons who were uh, special branch. The, there were still people in the police who were a continuation of the colonial police. And they were not kept in the, in the visible Kenya police, but they were kept in the KPR, Kenya Police Reserve. And these people did the dirty work. And they were holdovers from, from the colonial period. These persons had to be investigated, not only for what they might have done, but also for what are they doing there, whose orders do they follow, who are they accountable. JM Karaoke's wristwatch was discovered in a bathroom in a police officer's house in Majengo. The watch discovered by the son of the police officer was found days after JM's murder. The police officer was questioned by Ignatius Nderi and warned against speaking about the matter. Other police officers and witnesses were also arrested and questions of exactly what they knew about JM's murder. Some were beaten up, others locked up as the government moved the speed to cover up the former assistant minister's murder. And by 75, the, the, the country had rejected him totally. He made no pretense that he was uh, the president of whole, the whole of Kenya or anything, not at all. That is why in, in uh, 78, when Moy comes in, there's visible relief. The Parliamentary Select Committee set up to investigate James' murder hit a deadlock. President Jomo Kenyatta personally instructed members of the committee to drop the names of his minister and bodyguard who the committee had recommended for investigations into the murder of the slain member of parliament. Because he had the support of people from all over Kenya. That was reflected in the way the committee was set up and it was reflected in who was on the committee. And even Moy, you see Moy was then Home Minister and he was the one, Interior and so on, and he was the one who had to say that JM had gone to Zambia. And when it all blew up, he came into the house and you should find it in Hansard, 
he he stammered that he didn't know that this was not true so they had misled him as well a and he was not a part of it and he never he never uh, attempted to stop the committee from functioning. Yosaa Mwangi Karioki joined a long list of high-profile government officials assassinated by successful governments. I remember Moi Kibaki and that statement that he made that even it, if it takes a hundred years we want to know who and why was GM killed. Kibaki was elected president and despite the promises he made nothing moved. GM's family is still fighting to have some of their father's property in the hands of strangers returned to the family. Early 90s and um, we went to him to help to facilitate and uh, the people that went inside to see him actually told him that we want to have this meeting and then they, he was somehow non-committal and they said but aren't you the one that said even if it takes a hundred years and then he told them, well, a hundred years are not yet over. So I didn't think that there was any need for us to try and make any strides to see him individually as a family uh, to implement some new investigations or whatever it is. The family has also not stopped asking for the prosecution of the killers of the spoken member of parliament. For 20 years later, the killers of JM Karaoke have never been brought to book. Some died without facing trial and for cutting short the life of a man many described as a progressive next leader of a young Kenya. And that is a key, key issue for Kenya's future. We must address it. We must, this, is, this is at the heart of, of, of social equity. This is at the heart of settling the broken hearts of generations who, who have been kept out and kept out in, in a hidden war. That war is conducted through political assassinations, through enforced poverty, through keeping these people out of any government job patronage or employment or credit here. Josiah Mwangi Karaoke left behind a country that has not departed from a past he had wanted eradicated. We must look at JM's uh, speeches and his writings and what he was saying in Parliament very much from the point of view of what he saw because he saw things from Manyani long after he had left it. He was at the Nairobi race course, he was running horses with Lord Delamere, but he never forgot. Never forgot those camps, and he never forgot the people in those camps. And so he, he was alive to these issues, and they said nobody who reminds Kenyans, and particularly uh, the, the whole of Gemma, Kenya, of these broken promises, this is a real threat. A past where very few individuals wield massive power and wealth and millions struggling to make ends meet, or as he put it, a country of 10 millionaires and 10 million beggars. The Josiah Mwangi Karaoke assassination is still a case open. His family has since moved to court to try and trace some of his property, say to be in the hands of his friends. Next week on Case Files is the story of Titus Adungosi, a Nairobi University student killed by the Kano regime. Denison Sarigo for Case Files.